everybody. Um, so I am going to introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Dean Dauberful. Um, and today he is, so he is the chief of the Bureau of Water Resources at the St. John's Water Management District, um, where he works with aquatic and wetland scientists. Um, and so he and his staff conduct applied research and restoration projects in aquatic habitats throughout Northeast Florida. Um, in the past, he has served as adjunct faculty and served on graduate committees at the University of North Florida and here at UF. Um, and he earned his bachelor's from the University of Texas at Arlington and his PhD from Arizona State. Um, so today, Dr. Dauberful is going to be talking to us uh, about Lake Apopka, Florida, which is great. That is a case that I have particular research interests in, but from the social science uh, perspective. Um, so he's going to be talking about a case study of a succeeding lake restoration. So Dr. Dauberful, thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I do want to talk about Lake Apopka. Um, lake Apopka is fourth largest lake in the state, a uh, very significant water resource. Um, it is a case of a lake that uh, went from great to uh, one of the most polluted, and hopefully we uh, are getting back to great. So it's been a long winding road, um, and we've learned a lot of lessons, uh, some of which I want to talk about here. Um, so with that, I think I will get rolling. So just a quick um, description of the water management district. Florida's got five of them corresponding to major watersheds in the state. The St. John's uh, is obviously, hopefully obviously, the watershed of the St. John's River. It covers 18 counties in Northeast Florida. The Lake uh, Lake Apopka that we're going to be talking about is in the southwest portion of our district, and it straddles Lake and Orange counties. It also is the headwaters for the Ocklawaha River, which eventually uh, flows down through uh, past Silver Springs, through Rodman Reservoir, and ultimately into the, into the river. So a uh, very important lake, uh, discharges quite a bit of um, base flow to the upper Ocklawaha. A um, couple factoids about Lake Apopka uh, watershed, 183 square miles or uh, 47,000 hectares. Um, Lake Apopka itself is actually a pretty significant portion of this watershed. So the lake is 48 square miles, 12,000 hectares. Um, so 26% of the, of the watershed area. And that that becomes important when we start talking about uh, restoration and nutrient loading and things like that. Um, of particular note um, in Lake Apopka is the Lake Apopka North Shore. Um, we, we call it the North Shore, it's the restoration area. Uh, here in the image, you can see it highlighted in yellow. That's a uh, 30 square mile area, uh, 7,800 hectares. So that's about 16% of the, of the watershed area. Um, that we are most interested in that area um, because it was changed the most over the years and it had the most significant effects on water quality in the lake. So I will talk more about that, the North Shore area. Um, as they say, back in the day, Lake Apopka was uh, quite an amazing, uh, lake. It was clean, clear, uh, lots of native vegetation, uh, had an amazing fishery apparently. So uh, people would come from, you know, all over the country, all over the world really to uh, fish Lake Apopka. Um, it was quite a uh, economic engine back in the uh, 19th and early 20th century. Um, you can even see, this is interesting, uh, the AAA guidebook from 1936 um, indicated Lake Apopka as the most dependable fishing lake. Um, it had uh, largemouth bass, which of course everybody likes to fish for these days, but also smallmouth bass and uh, a pretty replete population of game fish. So tremendously, tremendously productive. Um, at the height 
um, in the late 19th century, there were uh, 21 major fish camps on the lake. So, um, you know, these are these were res essentially resort type communities with cottages and boat rentals. So um, huge, uh, huge uh, economic driver for that day and time. Um, some history of Lake Apopka, and I call this ancient because this is uh, goes back quite a while. Um, and I, as I mentioned initially, the lake has a very long history of um, anthropogenic influences, um, negative early on, and ho hopefully more positive recently. Um, beginning in the uh, late 1800s, uh, the Apopka Beauclair Canal was completed. So this is a canal that connects Lake Apopka with the next most downstream lake, which is Lake Beauclair. Um, so this provides um, enhanced flow, but also navigation. This functionally dropped the level of Lake Apopka and um, dewatered it for all intents and purposes. So first major hydrologic uh, um, change to the lake. In the 1920s, as the area uh, was starting to grow, uh, we started seeing domestic wastewater, um, i.e. Um, sewage treatment plants um, come online and they dumped directly into the lake. The largest being Winter Garden, but there are also a, a couple more around the lake. Um, another major input was uh, citrus processing water. So as everybody may realize, Florida was a huge citrus producer and the area had a lot of processing plants. So there was a lot of um, industrial wastewater that got dumped directly into the lake as well. Um, 1940s, uh, farmers started draining the um, marginal wetlands for farming purposes. Um, the wetlands had really deep um, peat muck that is excellent for farming. Um, so the farmers, um, started draining that and farming that and producing some act actually pretty uh, fabulous and productive crops. Um, probably not a surprise, 1947 uh, was the first documented lake-wide algal bloom um, and had, hadn't really stopped in the last 50 years after 1947. So, um, you know, the culmination of a lot of these anthropogenic stressors started to be seen in the lake water quality. Um, following those algal blooms, of course, in the 50s, sport fishing declines, uh, rough fish um, populations increase. And by rough fish, uh, we're talking about um, gar, uh, shad, um, thing, fish that nobody's interested in, and game fish populations um, suffer as a consequence of that, of that community shift. By the 1960s, it was getting, water quality was getting so bad that um, we started seeing widespread fish kills and the last of the fish camps closed in the 1960s. So uh, at this point, we're looking at um, a very heavily impacted lake. Um, I'd mentioned that uh, farming uh, started to occur on the North Shore. Um, you can see here a sequence of uh, development of those farms. So in 1941, um, we had uh, connected wetland essentially. So the lake's about 30,000 acres. We had about 20,000 acres of, of fringing wetland on the North Shore. This was connected to the lake and flooded seasonally with lake levels. And this was probably a very, very important resource for uh, fish recruitment, fish habitat, things like that. By 1947, they had started levying off and draining significant portions of, of the North Shore. And you can see in 1947, uh, I don't know, maybe 10% was already in farming, another 15% was um, uh, coming online for farming. By 1953, about 50 or more percent of the area um, was diked and drained for farming. And by 1985, uh, nearly 100% of that North Shore uh, wetland area was um, 
diked and drained for farming. Um, so we're talking 20,000 acres of, of farmland. The, the reason that this is um, detrimental to lake water quality is because of the nature of, of muck farming. So essentially the bottom of the farm is at, is at lake level. So it wants to flood. So the farmers have to keep water pumped off of the muck farms. Every time they do that, you're exposing organic soils, which oxidize and release phosphorus. So just the act of farming is constantly creating a source of phosphorus and you're constantly pumping that off into the lake. Um, in the off season, when they aren't growing, they flood the fields for uh, nematode and pest control. And when they wanna begin farming again, again, they pump all that nutrient rich water off. So they're pumping while they're farming and then there's a big slug of phosphorus in between seasons. So that type of farming is um, a huge nutrient load and turned out to be especially detrimental to Lake Apopka. Um, and it, it got bad, it got really bad in the 60s and 70s. Um, one of our uh, representatives, uh, coined it the Cent Central Florida's Emerald Badge of Shame. Uh, you can see the persistent algal bloom here and the, um, and the sediments that are kicked up by the, this boat motor. Um, here's another image um, from the 70s. This is pretty dramatic, I think. Um, you can see a whole lake algal bloom. I mean, the lake is just opaque green. And you can see the, um, the muck contrail, if you will, from the boat crossing the lake. So um, all vegetate, all submerged vegetation in the lake was extirpated at this time. You know, the combination of shading from the algae and from the, the muck that got stirred up, really the, there was virtually no euphotic zone for plants to grow in the lake. So because of that water quality degradation, um, we had uh, reduced clarity, essentially uh, secchi disks of you know, a couple centimeters maybe, just could not see into the water and light could not get into the water. Um, total loss of SAV and a uh, almost complete collapse of the fishery, of the game fishery. So serious impacts. Um, we thought, we think we, and I think history bears this out that high phosphorus loading was driving these changes. So that phosphorus loading, uh, you know, if you look at this little uh, flow diagram, um, resulted in more algae, increased sedimentation to the bottom. That's a positive feedback, creating more sediment resuspension, turbidity, um, and fewer plants. And in the case of Lake Apopka, this really was a pretty strong positive feedback loop. Um, in the field, what that looks like, if you look at the picture on the left, um, is a whole bunch of sediment that accumulated relatively rapidly. And sediment in the lake um, above the, the, sand, the native sandy bottom runs about half a meter to a meter typically. And that's typically you see two different layers. You see a consolidated flock layer uh, here depicted by CF, um, and you also see an unconsolidated flock layer, which is UCF, which overlies. Um, the interesting thing in Lake Apopka is this unconsolidated flock layer um, is almost neutrally buoyant. So any, any degree of wind or bioturbation or boat traffic um, stirs this stuff up and it stays in suspension um, for quite a number of hours to possibly days. And hopefully this will work. There's a little video clip of, um, this is what the unconsolidated flock layer looks like in the lake. And you can see it, this is a, uh, a uh, core tube that we've taken out of the sediments. Just the slightest bit of agitation and this stuff just stirs up into the water column and stays suspended. Um, Eventually, some of it compacts down into a consolidated form, but because of the productivity of the lake, um, 
there's always a supply of, of sedimentation. Um, so that's a that's a particular has been a particular problem in Lake Apopka. So I've kind of set the stage here. Um, you know, we've had a beautiful lake, great fishery, um, really heavily impacted and turned into, uh, frankly, a fetid mess, <laughs> an emerald badge of shame. Um, you know, understandably, people started getting a little worked up about this and uh, the politicians correspondingly started paying attention. And so um, to revisit the recent history of Lake Apopka from the 70s on, um, in the 1970s, um, funds were made available and you know, political will started um, growing uh, to study the lake. So um, EPA had a number of studies. Um, I know um, a number of uh, university groups um, studied the lake. Ramesh had a huge, Ramesh Reddy had a huge role in some of that early work. Um, so there was a tremendous amount of, of data gathered in the, in the 70s um, and through the 80s. Uh, into the 80s, the point source pollutions, uh, pollution was reduced. So the wastewater treatment plants that I talked about, Winter Garden and others, um, and the industrial wastewater um, started being reduced um, and subject to, to permit conditions. Um, Things really picked up um, 1985 to 1987. Um, the legislature, the Florida legislature passed the Lake Apopka Restoration Act. That gave um, our water, the St. John's River Water Management District, some regulatory authority over, um, over the farms and development in the area, which um, helped tremendously. Um, and then you know, we saw little incremental improvements, but not quite enough to satisfy folks. So in 1996, um, more legislation was passed that uh, most notably established a TMDL, uh, water quality standard. So our target uh, phosphorus concentration in the lake became 55 parts per billion. Um, it granted additional rulemaking authority to the water management district and DEP. Uh, and maybe most importantly, that legislation um, provided a significant amount of funds for a farm buyout. Um, by this point, um, after all of the studies that had been done in the 70s and 80s, um, it became pretty clear that the, the farms were the single largest contributor of phosphorus to the lake and um, probably the easiest uh, source to address. So, you know, the legislature was pretty progressive at the time, and they, um, they decided that uh, they were going to put their money where their mouth was and address that, that issue. Um, since that point in time, um, restoration activities, you know, ramped up in the, in the mid to late 90s and um, have been going ever since. And we have uh, essentially what we like to say is we put Lake Apopka on a diet and exercise regime. So if you want to get fit, right, diet and exercise. So this is the, the limnology style. Um, so the diet, right, diet, reduce calories coming in. Um, in this case, what we wanted to do is reduce the phosphorus going into the lake. So 1984, uh, if, you, if you look at this figure, um, all of that dark area in the, the red outline on the North Shore, all of the dark areas are uh, muck farms. So that's the condition in 1984. Uh, recall all of those farms are pumping out into the lake um, pretty continuously. Um, here's a figure from 2019. Same, same figure, um, different color palette. Um, but uh, what you can see on the, on the North Shore now, that is all wetland. So we have a mosaic of um, open slough-like wetlands, wet, wet prairie, um, some shrub marsh, but essentially no more farm, all wetland. That's the diet. So we 
we we went from a condition where these farms were pumping fairly continuously to stay dry to a, a condition where we only pump very minimally um, to maintain proper water levels on the North Shore. So our our phosphorus being transferred from the North Shore into the lake has gone down to um, very very low levels. So um, so that is the diet essentially. Um, this did not happen overnight. This is um, 20 plus years of work um, to put this diet into place. Um, but what was reassuring to us was that a lot of restoration um, kind of follows the Pareto principle, if you will, right? So 20% of the effort gets you 80% of the, uh, the results. Um, even some of our early restoration activities, here you can see, um, farm fields still in production, but we had, the, the water management district had uh, required that these farms put in treatment reservoirs. So you can see a, a blue reservoir. So this is a reservoir where the farms pump into and out of. So rather than into the lake, they, they um, use the, the reservoir as an intermediate water source. So even as early as 95, just that step alone um, resulted in, uh, improved water quality conditions. And you can see here, these two tiny little dots are the first uh, examples of submerged aquatic vegetation we found in the lake. So we've gone 40 years without SAV. We took a few baby steps in restoration and um, SAV, um, particularly eelgrass, Valsinaria started popping up. So um, we found that very reassuring and um, it really convinced us that you know we were on the right course. We did have to deal with some legacy issues. Um, I'm not going to go into this. These are um, these are things that deserve their own uh, chapters and books. Um, one of the things was when the water management district had purchased these farms, we were still stuck with um, a blank canvas and a lot of peat-based muck that had the potential to release phosphorus. So we had to do something about that. Um, and what we ended up doing was uh, finding a source for alum, uh, alum residuals. And these are uh, residuals from uh, water treatment plants, drinking water plants. So we found a source in Melbourne and they gave us 66,000 tons of uh, of used alum. And we trucked that up to the North Shore and spread that out on um, about 7,000 acres of these fields. So the intent here is this alum, which has residual phosphorus binding capacity. Um, we were using this to cap um, this bare dirt um, to reduce the amount of phosphorus uh, exported when we reflooded it and started to restore the wetland. Um, so that was a pretty novel, novel approach um, that took a lot of effort and a lot of coordination. Um, another thing that I will mention is that um, the North Shore, uh, a lot of the farming occurred before pesticides were widely controlled. And we were left with a uh, pretty significant legacy of highly toxic uh, pesticides on the North Shore. Um, things that are you know, completely banned today, uh, DDT, DDE, toxaphene, um, pretty much any, uh, any notable organochlorine pesticide from the 60s or 70s was found on the North Shore. Um, it was in low levels over much of the, much of the area, but it was in a, a acute, acutely toxic quantities in some areas where there had been spills or airstrips where they had um, mixed the chemicals or things like that. So um, that was a big, um, big task we had to take on before we could restore. And we did a couple novel things there. We we simply dug up uh, some of the most contaminated dirt and took it to hazardous um, waste landfills. Um, but we did a lot of research, and we happened on this technique where we could invert the soil. Um, so essentially you take contaminated soil at the surface, you flip it um, and replace it with um, uncontaminated soil from underneath. And 
we found a plow, the world's largest plow, apparently, um, in of all places, uh, Texas. Um, and this plow could invert, uh, I think, 52 inches of soil. And you can see this guy standing here. So it, it dug deep and it really flipped that soil right over. Subsequent testing showed that um, it indeed worked and that, that pesticide um, concentrations at the surface and fluxing were very, very low. So um, I'm not gonna go into it, but it, that was a, a huge effort uh, that we undertook. Um, today, these are a couple recent shots from the North Shore. Um, you can see the lake in the top shot, you can see the lake out in the distance and um, similar on the bottom shot. And you have to admit, it looks a lot different than it did. Um, it looks beautiful out there now. Um, these are high water shots. Um, you know, it doesn't always look this wet, but um, it definitely has come, come along quite a bit. So it's uh, restoration's well on its way on the North shore. Um, so having taken care of uh, the diet portion, which is the, the North Shore and the export of phosphorus, um, the next thing we have to, had to deal with was um, the internal, uh, the phosphorus that is already in the lake. So, you know, in like our analogy, right? Once you start to diet, you, um, you've reduced your calories coming in, but now you gotta start, uh, start jogging or something to, to to pull the weight off. So we've done a few things and I'll just highlight a, a, a few of our more, more notable um, techniques. Um, one of the things that we put into place was what we call the marsh flowway. So this is an area that was former muck um, farming areas, um, lower than the lake um, because of soil oxidation. And we thought that, hey, we can, um, turn this into a treatment wetland and we can um, uh, run water through it and capture uh, particulate phosphorus and sediments. So we set up a demo program um, back in the early 2000s, um, very small facility, worked great. Um, we then moved on to a larger facility, which is about... Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, four or 500 acres, I think. And you see a, a diagram in the, the lower left here. So what we do is we draw water in by gravity from the lake and it flows through four independent cells of the flowway. And it's got very high hydraulic loading, about a hundred and, uh, I'm blanking. Very, it's, it's much higher than a treatment wetland, um, a typical treatment wetland, because we're trying to capture particulate material. And it, it has worked quite fantastically. So the water flows through these four independent cells and into a, um, a catch basin, which then is um, pumped back out into the lake. And it, um, we've had it online for uh, about 15 or 20 years, I think. Um, to date, that flowway has removed over 65,000 pounds of phosphorus, uh, 130 million pounds of total suspended solids, um, and over 2 million pounds of nitrogen. So this, this flowway has been uh, remarkably effective, and it's a, a very cheap way to remove phosphorus, um, nitrogen, and sediments from the lake. Um, in fact, it, it, it requires very little maintenance. We just had to take it down for a year to um, regrade the cells and um, you know, shortcuts form and reduce the effectiveness over time. Um, but by and large, very low maintenance. We can actually filter um, up to 40% of the lake volume per year through this facility. So, um, so this has been really, really helpful in, um, in our exercise program for removing phosphorus. Um, another program that we're very proud of is the rough fish harvest in the lake. Um, this, is a, this lake is tremendously productive for the kind of fish that nobody wants. Um, 
gizzard shad, gar, um, more recently tilapia, armored catfish, all sorts of um, uh, what we call, I don't know, garbage fish, I guess, in the lake. Um, and nobody wants these things. So what do you do with them? Well, we eventually found a, uh, an outfit that wanted to buy them for crab bait. And we said, excellent, we will, you can sell them for a small amount, we'll subsidize you. And, um, and we formed a partnership. And we've been doing that since 1993. So um, every year um, we have independent fishermen that go out and we provide um, uh, agreements with these fishermen. They fish and they supply to this, um, this fish house. And um, it has been working very, very well. So in the last 25 years or so, um, we've removed over 29 million pounds of fish. And that represents over 238,000 pounds of phosphorus um, directly in fish biomass. And you know, this has a twofold benefit to the lake. Um, the first, of course, is that you know, fish have bones, bones are very rich in phosphorus. So it's an actual um, direct removal of phosphorus um, through the fish bodies. More importantly though, um, shad, which is the, um, the majority of our catch out there, um, they feed in the sediments. And so they um, continually um, dig into the sediments to find food. So they're resuspending a lot of material into the water column. Um, they're also uh, eating things in the sediments and excreting nutrients into the water column. So they're an indirect source of nutrients as well. So we get a, it's kind of a twofer. You know, we, we remove phosphorus directly, but we also remove um, the effect of these fish. Um, we've been able to keep this population um, at pretty low levels, which um, has the added benefit of um, reducing competition for plankton food sources with game fish. So it's a, um, it's a, a partial biomanipulation tool as well. Um, we've tried some more, um, shall we say experimental things. Uh, one of those uh, things that we did was a sediment uh, sump project. Um, I showed earlier the unconsolidated flocculent sediments, which are uh, really highly mobile in the lake, almost like uh, it's been described as a fluid mud, uh, has the potential to move around quite a bit. Um, so one of the things we tried was digging a sump. So you can think of this as the uh, uh, kind of the corner behind the couch in your living room where all the dust bunnies um, collect. So um, we permitted three of these, we, we tried one, so this is simple, simply a, um, a hole, a kind of a conical hole that um, hopefully fills up with this fluid mud that we can at some later date go back and clean it out. Um, we located it near the, uh, the canal that exits the lake, um, hoping that um, you know, water flow into that canal would concentrate those, um, those sediments. Um, to this point, um, it actually seems to be, you know, some of us were a little dubious about this, but to this point, it actually seems to be working. Um, in the last two years, we've collected uh, almost a foot of um, soft sediments in there. So, um, so you know, sediments are moving, uh, they're collecting there. It'll make it easy to clean it out. Not a panacea for the lake, certainly, but you know, yet another route where we can um, potentially easily remove some of those flocculent sediments. I did not realize this was a video. That's pretty cool. Um, another part of our exercise is uh, putting uh, native plants back into the lake. So uh, over the years, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and our agency has put in a large number of, of plants. Um, FWC put in several hundred acres of, uh, of spatter dock, 
which you can see that's the, the plant in the, um, the upper panels. So these are um, rooted but floating plants. Um, and more recently, our agency has put in um, a large number of plants. Uh, we've put in uh, about, we put in about 60 acres total in the past three years. Um, we put in about 28,000 floating plants, um, primarily the, the Nufar, um, Nymphaea, um, water lilies, things like that. Um, we've also, uh, we contracted with University of Florida actually um, to look at uh, ways to most successfully plant uh, submerged plants. Um, that was, uh, let's see, Laura Reynolds was uh, PI on that. Um, that was a great project. They, came, they, they produced some um, great results and essentially gave us a handbook of methods to um, use to most successfully plant SAV. So in the last couple of years, we put in 300,000 uh, submerged plants. And that's the, uh, the video you see here at the bottom. What um, they're putting in here are, are plants weighted with plaster of Paris, um, which helps hold them to the bottom and encourages root growth into the bottom. So um, we, it hasn't been a lot. When you look at the total number of acres we've put in, you know, compared to the 30,000 acres of the lake, um, you know, 60 acres of SAV, a couple hundred acres of emergent plants doesn't seem like much, but those plants are tremendously effective. So the emergent and floating plants uh, really anchor the sediments very nicely. They also buffer wave action from um, causing erosion. Um, and the SAV plants that we've put in, the submerged plants um, are tremendously productive. They were flowering within weeks of putting them in the, in the, um, the lake. And each plant, um, particularly Valsinaria, each plant can produce hundreds of seeds. So, you know, if you can get um, successful plantings um, put in initially, uh, you really get geometric growth um, from, from even small amounts of planting. So what, what's been happening? We've been, we put the lake on this diet and exercise uh, routine and um, what's happening. Here, here you see a figure, um, a time series showing total phosphorus concentrations in the lake with a black line. Um, superimposed over that are some of these restoration strategies, uh, the farm buyouts, the marsh flowway, um, farm BMPs, um, shad harvest, those things. And what you can see is that uh, over time, the phosphorus in the lake has declined dramatically. Um, we went, you know, pre-restoration, we went from concentrations of almost, you know, 0.3 milligrams per liter. And currently we are bouncing down around our limit. So the title um, of the talk is a case study of a succeeding restoration. So we are not quite at our target, um, but we are really, really darn close. Uh, which restoration strategy was the most effective? Um, I don't think we can answer that. Um, I think what this figure is trying to convey is that, you know, we threw a bunch of different um, restoration techniques at this lake and its watershed, um, each of which had a, a partial effect but it really took the, the totality of all of these strategies to um, get to the point where we're at today. So, um, you know, it's lake restoration is not uh, easy and it's not straightforward. And, it, um, and I think it requires a, a pretty comprehensive suite of, um, of interventions. So um, currently, um, you know, I've told you that, you know, we've done all these things. Phosphorus is, um, has come down dramatically in the lake. Um, so what does the lake look like? You know, is it, are we getting um, anything that we want to see? Um, I would argue that we are. Uh, it looks really, really good out there. 
the water is, you know, if you just put a boat in on any given day, the water is going to look still look turbid. But um, the plants, especially in the riparian um, uh, the, or the littoral areas, um, appear to be getting sufficient light to establish and spread. Um, in some areas of the lake, um, you can see pretty dense and extensive uh, plots of submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, and it's growing rather deep. You can see in the right picture, um, we've got about, I don't know, a meter, a little over a meter, meter and a half of water depth and very, um, very healthy looking eelgrass. So, uh, so the grass is, is loving it, especially in the, the littoral areas. Um, we're seeing this essentially exponential growth in the coverage of grass. Um, these acreage numbers are underestimates. These are only, these are areas that are uh, shallow enough where people's waders don't fill up. So we, we, uh, we don't typically sample deeper than, uh, let's say, wader depth. Um, so these, these actual numbers are underestimates. But what we are seeing from aerial photographs and from our sampling is exponential increase in native vegetation. So um, that is trending very, very well. And we think that, um, that we're on the right course with the SAV. Um, fisheries, fisheries are doing really well out there too. Um, here you see just a couple examples. The, uh, the fish on the left was um, picked up in electro, the routine electroshocking that um, FWC does in the lake. Um, bass populations have been increasing. Um, part of that is uh, a stocking program that they've done over a few years. Part of that, I think, is our shad harvesting program, reducing the, the competition with, um, with rough fish. So um, on the right is actually a funny picture. Um, this is one of our uh, field uh, staff. They were out monitoring SAV and this bass actually just jumped into the airboat. So, um, you know, the joke is the fishing's so good, you don't even have to fish out there. Um, so yeah, fish are doing, doing um, quite nicely. Um, in 2019, before, the, uh, before COVID hit, um, they actually had a uh, Upper Ocklawaha fishing tournament, a Bassmasters tournament, and four of the top 10 finishers um, fished in Lake Apopka. So, you know, even, even the bass tournament um, folks are starting to notice that Lake Apopka is coming back. So, um, so bottom line, diet and exercise, it's, it's working. Uh, the environment and the, the water quality is looking uh, quite a bit better. Um, and the larger community is noticing. So, you know, we've got um, more than 360 bird species that have been documented on the North Shore. Um, tremendously productive, great bird watching habitat. Um, second only to Merritt Island, I believe, in terms of number of species in Florida. Um, and lots and lots of public um, bird watchers out there. These, I don't know, I think they're crazy because they're out there before sun comes up, but um, lots and lots of bird watchers. Uh, we also have a wildlife drive, which uh, attracts more than 150,000 visitors per year. So that goes through the North Shore. It's got um, audio stops and things like that, that the public can um, you know, appreciate the wetlands and the species um, out there. Uh, lots, and lots of hikers and bikers. Uh, we've got trails out there that are, are heavily used um, and a growing number of events. So um, you know, things like you know, marathons, um, orienteering courses, um, all sorts of things are, are hosted out there. Um, and a growing population of alligators, which everybody seems to love. So, um, so the lake is doing better. The North Shore is um, well on its way to fully restored, um, and the public is noticing. So, 
I think that we have done a, um, a pretty good job, not, not just our um, agency, but definitely, you know, with cooperation from DEP and FWC and, and the legislature who provided a lot of the funds. Um, so we're almost there. Uh, having said that, um, we do have challenges ahead, things that we didn't, um, that didn't exist before and that we didn't anticipate. Um, one of those issues you can see here, this is a, a Sentinel-2 satellite image from August 21st of this year, so uh, about a month ago. Um, it's been enhanced. Uh, what you can see, the dark areas that are fringing the outside of the lake, particularly kind of on the northeast and southern um, areas, that's hydrilla. So um, apparently, uh, we have improved water quality sufficiently that not only does native SAV uh, love it and get a toe hold, but hydrilla has um, really moved in with a vengeance. Um, FWC, who maps the hydrilla, um, is estimating um, as much as 10,000 acres um, to this point in a 30,000 acre lake. So um, unanticipated huge problem in, in Lake Apopka. We've improved the water clarity, um, but by doing so, we've improved the habitat for uh, other invasive species. Um, not just Lake Apopka, other lakes that um, have been proved uh, also seem to be having a hydrilla problem. So um, could be climate change, uh, it could be cleaner water, it could be a combination, but um, that is definitely a, an issue. So that'll, we'll be paying attention to that um, going forward. And that is all I have. So I would be happy to entertain any questions, I guess, at this point. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. That was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, so we have uh, just a few minutes for questions. Um, if anybody has questions for Dr. Darberpole. I would like to ask a question, if I may. Certainly. Um, so with the um, restoration target that is currently set in terms of uh, phosphorus concentration in the water column, do you think that will be sufficient to eventually have the lake change back into a clear water lake? Or do you anticipate that it will remain in a, at least, you know, moderately turbid state um, under the existing restoration target? Uh, well, the, the target is a, a phosphorus target. Um, so we, we think it will, <laughs> that is our, you know, um, all of that work that we did in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s suggested that that was an appropriate target. Um, so we think that that will do it. it. It will not do it instantaneously, clearly, right? I mean, when you hit 0.05, it doesn't flip magically, right? It's still gonna need some time at that low concentration to reduce productivity, reduce sedimentation and allow time for that sediment to compact. Um, if all of that happens <laughs> smoothly, I think that's a sufficient uh, concentration goal. Um, but, you know, there's things like hydrilla, right? And, you know, increased precipitation, perhaps increased temperature um, that could drive productivity differently. So we don't know. Short answer, we don't know, but we think that's appropriate. Okay, thank you. We also have a question in the chat. Has anyone followed up with looking at toxicology levels in the wildlife to date? Would you want to eat anything that you fish from the lake? Oh, that is, a, that is an excellent question. Um, short answer, on the North Shore where the farming occurred and where we've restored uh, wetlands, no. No, don't eat anything. <laughs> um, we routinely monitor uh, fish um, primarily because a lot of um, raptors are eating fish out there, lots of ospreys and eagles and things like that. Um, they are still, uh, they are too um, 
there's too much toxicity for human consumption. Um, we've been cleared for restor full restoration by the US Fish and Wildlife Service because the toxicity is sufficiently low for wildlife consumption, um, but human consumption is a much lower standard. Um, one reason that we, there's another controversy in that originally all those wetlands were connected to the lake, which, was, which benefited the lake. We've maintained the levee separating the lake from the wetland primarily for that re the toxicity reason. There's still lingering toxicity issues out there. We feel like it's um, very prudent to maintain that levee and keep that separation so that the lake is not affected. Fish in the lake are clean. You can, you can eat fish in the lake all day long. Uh, we just are discouraging any wildlife consumption on the North Shore. And Ignacio also asked, uh, has any of this been published? Um, not as well as I would have liked. <laughs> um, we, we do publish. There are a few publications out there. Um, we, publishing is not one of our uh, primary goals. We like to, people to publish, but you know the workload is such that it's hard to do. Um, we have a lot of uh, gray literature in our library, which is searchable online. Um, and there are a few publications floating around out there. But um, unfortunately, a lot of this information is, um, is gray. So, but you know, feel free to contact me if you have any, you know, questions or, or data questions or anything like that. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end of our, our session. I know some of you have to sign off. Dr. Darbapol, I know you have somewhere else to be. Um, so I wanna thank you again. That was a great presentation. Like I said, I have, you know, I, I have done some social science research um, around this case. Um, so maybe we'll connect at some point in the future and we can chat about that. Um, and for everyone else, um, so next week we have, um, uh, Michelle Leonard coming in from the library to talk to us and she's going to be co-presenting um, with somebody else so that's exciting if you have any questions or concerns in the meantime obviously feel free to get in touch with me via email anytime otherwise I will see you all next Monday thank you so much for being here